moon than we do about the deep sea. We knew we've mapped the moon's surface in great detail. We know it has no atmosphere, no weather, no active geology. On the other hand, the deep ocean is complex. It's dynamic. It's a dynamic system. It's constantly changing and evolving. And we've mapped, I think, just a quarter of the ocean floor, more or less. Less? Less. 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 All right, we'll get there. So the ocean also presents this with a great challenge. How do we get the balance right between exploration and conservation? How do we ensure that exploration does not lead to exploitation? So here to help me navigate these treacherous waters, two men who have been thinking very hard and doing something about the problem, Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, which he grew into the largest hedge fund in the world. His innovations have changed the way that we think about investing. He's now turning his hand to helping us think about how we explore the ocean. And Dr. Vincent Perribone, co-CEO and chief science officer for OceanX, also a professor of cellular and molecular physiology and neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine. Go Bulldogs. He's conducted ocean research explorations um, across the world. So, Ray, tell us first, how should we look at this issue? Well, let's, I mean, let's look at the big picture. Uh, the ocean is 72% of the world's surface, and the highest point on Earth is equal to the greatest depth. So it is more than two-thirds of the planet and its world under there is totally unexplored. Mm. So just imagine that you had a continent that nobody went to and other species, and yet it's our most important natural resource. And it's thrilling. Like, you're not going to see aliens in outer space. You're going to see them down in the ocean, right? right? So the life and what there is to be learned. So just imagine that it's totally unexplored continent, right. and, so, and it's thrilling. So we must uh, explore it, and we must understand it, because also development is an important issue right now. Mm. There's a commercial desire also to go down there and, mm -hmm. to, and deal with it. To, what are the resources? What are all the things that can mm -hmm. be done? And if we don't understand it and achieve the right balance between, as you said, exploring and, and protecting it or exploiting it, we're going to be in problem. And so I think it's the most unbelievable thing. I feel so incredibly lucky. Mm. Jacques Cousteau had a big effect on me, you know? I, I, I would watch him explore, and then I would watch on, on TV. So my mission became to do that, to explore mm. and to show it in the media. And so I started to do that about 11 years ago. And then um, I had Vince on one of my, uh, in the Solomon Islands, one of our explorations, got to know him. I asked him, would you come on as chief scientist? And so he and I now are doing that with a, you know, a, a good team. So that's the reason to do it. Mm. And so what we're doing is we're exploring and we're showing others. Um, and we want to show the world what it looks like so they fall in love with it, so they're excited. We want to teach children mm. um, at how to uh, enjoy it and have school programs and so on. Because it's our biggest, most interesting thing. What, what we did is we went around to the, the best oceanographic institutes around and we asked them what are their dreams mm. and we put it on the ship so it's fabulous and then we worked with uh, Jim Cameron you know who mm -hmm. Titanic and Avatar and all uh, to create the media platform so that there's great media showing what is being done by the ship so it has the best cutting-edge technologies that exist uh, we have two vehicles that go down 6,000 meters, mm. which covers 98% of the world's ocean, um, and amazing technologies and so on. So you got a flavor, and you also got a flavor for the fact that we have children's programs, mm. we have um, museum exhibitions, traveling exhibitions, so that we show it and engage people. Tell me, a, give me a sense of how, of some of the advances that have come in terms of knowledge, and maybe even further than that, pharmaceutical advances that have come from what we've learned, what you've learned about the ocean. 
I'll, I'll start by, uh, you saw a little clip of us discovering the giant squid. Mm. Okay, that was, it was interesting, but it, it was exciting. I'll let the scientists tell you about the various things that we've discovered, the, something like 90 papers and a lot of stuff, but you, all over right. you All right, what have we discovered? So, so the deep ocean and all of the ocean actually has a range of organisms and animals and biology that doesn't exist on the terrestrial. So what we're doing, everywhere we go, we collect, we study, we examine the genomes of these organisms, and that information is extremely valuable to the larger pharmaceutical, larger uh, biotech development organisms. Because with the advent of AI, the use of that genomic material to develop modern medicines mm -hmm. and actually synthetic manufacturing processes has become a, a, quite a large thing. So we, we develop, so we collect the data, we collect the, the genomes of these organisms, of, and essentially that's extremely valuable to that market. So, so they've, we're constantly being approached to sell and purchase that, that, mm -hmm. that data. And the discovery of these ecosystems and organisms in that depth is this, as Ray said, is the sort of last remaining frontier, mm -hmm. essentially in the, in the known you know, solar system. I think if you go on, uh, for the last three years we've been in the Red Sea, uh, sea for the, and you'll get a sense of some of the things that were discovered. So it's not just the, um, we always discover new species. We always discovered okay. um, biomimicry and all of that. Mm -hmm. When Vince first came on to the ship, he was dealing with uh, neuroscience and how he could light up brains and human beings by, because of bioluminescence and biofluorescence. Right. And but uh, tell them about some of the discoveries that we found in the Red Sea since we're here. Tell them about the Red yeah. Sea. So we've been mapping from all the way from the Farrisun Islands all the way through to the Jordan Coast. Mapping, collecting, studying the organisms in this. And Carlos, who was just here on the stage earlier, was the leader of that expedition, discovering uh, five new families of coral sitting out mm. here in these waters, discovering animals that live in the depths of the Red Sea because the Red Sea is so warm. So entire, entire collections of animals that were not known to exist at all in that depth. Hmm. So corals, sponges, types of invertebrates, and in those, as Ray is saying, are all this extreme chemistry and all this extreme life that's like being on another planet. The right. Red Sea is odd because the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. It's unusual Interesting. anywhere else in the, in the world. So having animals that live around there, also animals that live on plastic, that hmm. consume plastic. We found organisms that, that live we on We don't want to tell anybody petroleum. about that, though, do we? Well, it's, that's a major, <laughs> per, major campaign to right. see how they live and ecosystems that are developed. Also, living around petroleum deposits, hmm. living off of petroleum deposits. So all that was part of what the adventure we saw in the Red Sea. And then tell them about geology. Um, in other words, um, you were not just discovering species and uh, all the other stuff that you referred to, but uh, making clear what the geological discoveries are. So we, we, up in the Kalvavakaba, in the area where Neom has done, we've been studying the geology as... You've just been mentioned. there, right? Just yeah. still there, actually. The vessel okay. is sitting there in, the, in Neom right now. And looking at the underwater, because there's a lot of uh, development that's going to happen along that coastline, and how to maximize, and as Ray's saying, we discovered all kinds of interesting geology underwater in that area. Like what? Which is, which is valuable to know places where... It's Moses to do crossing the... <laughs> Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the parting of the Red Sea. All right, I'm off on the touch. Sorry, we found this enormous crack that runs between the Egyptian coast and Saudi Arabia that is, right. that is now being viewed as a potential idea of where the sea might have actually parted uh, around 2,000 years ago, you know, right. years ago. Maybe that was part of the phenomenon that led to the... To the uh, it's, it's a beautiful crack, and it runs right across from Tehran Island all the way to uh, Sharm el Sheikh. How extraordinary. But the geology is very important there because also to think about the stability or the instability of the area and how you're mm -hmm. dealing with that. So there's the geology and, um, uh, and then also archeological discoveries. Yeah, at some places we landed on, uh, again, in the deep, which is deeper than divable range, we found uh, vases and amphiphoras mm -hmm. and everything, which immediately indicates you know, human existence because that part of the world, right. the water was lower mm -hmm. years ago. So you don't see it unless you get down and look for it. We also found a wreck down there that was not known, which uh -huh. is home to squid, which has never been seen before. You know, having a wreck that large squid live on, actually, I don't think most people know that there are enormous squid that live in the Red Sea, right. and apparently they live around wrecks, which is unusual, and they're not afraid of, uh, of light, which is also an unusual feature. So, and, quite a party down there. And before <laughs> we did that, it was totally unknown. Totally unknown. Hmm. 
And so the Red Sea is just one of the places that we're going. We're right. now going to other places, Indonesia, other places. So let's, well, let's talk about, about Indonesia because there's an interesting example there about the mangroves as carbon sequestration. And when I was thinking about what you were doing there, it sounds like you're measuring, you're mapping all the way from the coastline, That's right. all the way to the deep oceans and looking at where tsunamis might start. So there's a, a variety of things, of ways if we were gonna actually quantify the, the value of what you're doing, you're able to look from everything from carbon sequestration to how tsunamis might form. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Indonesia as well. I'll tell you the big picture and he'll tell you okay. the real stuff. Uh, th the, big, the big picture is that uh, Indonesia has the greatest bi underwater biodiversity in the world. Hmm. And it's enormous. And they don't know what's there at all. Hmm. And it, Indonesia's changing. Indonesia's developing. So the government needs to understand what's there and then to have a plan hmm. for dealing what's there. Right. And so, okay, now Vince, you'll tell about all the particulars that we're well, they're interested in looking at. You mentioned mangroves, for example. Right. Mangroves are a little bit in competition with coastal development. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're great protectors against tsunamis, and that area is a huge tsunami risk. So part of what we'll be doing when we're in Indonesia next year is, as you said, mapping the potential fault lines, which have never been mapped actually. Hmm. The largest tsunami that erupted a few years ago that caused a huge amount of death and loss came from a particular area in Indonesia. It's never actually been mapped on. It's never been seen underwater. Hmm. We'll go see that for the first time. The Java Trench in the south, very dangerous zone. There's an area there that has virtually no seismic activity. And what that means is it's going to have big seismic activity. Also never hmm. seen that area. But very interesting to go down and put sensors and seismic monitors in that area. Very important to give a heads up when that, when that shifts down the wall. Hmm. So as, as Ray said, the entire region, those two plates are crashing, full of seismic activity, something like 200 earthquakes a day in that area, hmm. very small ones. So very important to study it and understand it. But also, it's also sort of the, the middle of the biodiversity golden triangle in that area. So it's the largest underwater biodiversity. A lot of the shallow water has been looked at. The deep has completely remains completely unexplored. We were there several years ago and made you know, revolutionary discoveries of organisms that live in that area. Now we're going to go back with a much more efficient platform. And so then what we do is we, um, what do you, I don't, I don't know, do you call it film anymore? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> make content. We make content. That's, thank you for the help. We make a lot of content so that all around the world, mm -hmm. everybody can see this and be inspired. And it's also great for the Indonesian government because they can right. show what they have. And then we take all the data. We have fabulous data and we make the data all available for everybody. Mm. I've watched some of the YouTube videos and they are absolutely fantastic. And they come out with very regular, um, on a regular calendar, regular content calendar, in fact. Uh, and what I, what's extraordinary is, are there scientists doing that all at the same time? Do you have a separate media Separate station? media. Separate media that's on the boat. So there's two things going on at once and they're all working together. That's right. All right, I love that. Now, I was going to suggest that maybe you were only going to warm water parts, Indonesia, Red Sea, but then I saw you went to Norway. Uh, so what are you doing in the, with the government of Norway? So, so the government of Norway has probably one of the most advanced and I would say sort of best example of fishery management programs in the world. And, and in Indonesia was very interested. So we brought Indonesian uh, folks from the Indonesian Fisheries Institute to Norway to see what they've been doing in sort of aquaculture. Mm. It's a really an amazing setup. Indonesia is one of the largest aquacultural uh, uh, countries in the world. So they want to get, learn a little lesson from how the uh, Norwegians and how Norwegians have developed this very nice interaction between, the, between business and between the science. It's actually a very symbiotic relationship. The scientists go on board the fishing boats and they have a very stable, they were having a, a crashing fisheries and now their fisheries is quite stable actually hmm. as a result of this interface and this interaction between science and, and, and the, hmm. the fisheries industry. So Indonesia is looking for that because they have a very serious situation going forward with their fisheries. So we went there to study fisheries, to study the fjords that are up there because we brought our, our uh, study these bizarre sharks that live in the deep mm -hmm. down there. I saw the a very good sharks. YouTube about the sharks. Yes, the very cool sharks. <laughs> the only glowing sharks we know of live in the bottom of those fjords mm -hmm. in Norway. And although the Norwegians have an amazing, you know, underwater uh, research institution, they actually didn't have the facilities that we had on the vessel. So mm -hmm. we were sort of crowded by Norwegians to come and hang out with us on the boat and, and Indonesians to see these magical things. And what you're saying about the media cadence, 
every time you go in the water, you have a story. Every time we put right. a sub down, every time we put an ROV down into these areas, as Ray said, it is a totally new world. And Norway, you would think it's cold water, unbelievable. Hmm. Unbelievable, large sharks, things that never come to the surface. So it's just waiting there to be explored. So for us, we're lucky. You know, Ray was the first to kind of do this and to get down into the deep and to bring all these assets down there. And so mm -hmm. for us, we're sort of ahead of the game. We're very fortunate to be everywhere we go has never been seen before. So it's, it's a fantastic adventure. It's extraordinary. Let's focus on one other area and then we'll go back to the kind of investment side. But what about the Azores? What are you doing uh, in the Azores? So in the Azores, they have been studying these large sea mounds in the area around their country. And those seamounts are hugely fertile zones for fisheries. One of the largest industries in the age is fishing. They're trying to re maintain the stability in those fisheries, which are also sliding. Mm -hmm. But those mounds, the deep mounds, they want to get those identified as marine protected areas. But without identifying the novelty of those, those reefs, they've been for five years, they've been studying these deep reefs there. They've never seen them. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, we went there and we, we, we drove around the mounds and we wor did work part of a National Geographic series. It was so amazing to them, they begged us to return. So on the way back, we were sort of driving in the neighborhood, we stopped by and we did enough um, imagery and mapping and collection of species, something around 2,000 specimens that they will now designate both of those mounds as marine protected areas. And that will allow them to reduce fishing directly above those, but that will actually enhance fishing around the entire Azores, because a lot of the fish go there to breed, and if you kill them while they're breeding, then you don't get good fish for the rest right. of the area. So we found fish breeding zones in the air, coral, huge upwellings of nutrients coming from the deep. So all that is a beautiful zone to build a fisheries that spreads to the rest of the islands. So if they can identify those areas and protect them, they're gonna sustain their fisheries. I wonder, Ray, how you look at this as an investor, because we're not always very good at valuing the intangible idea about what you have, right? So I, I love that you're exploring. I love that you're finding new, new species. I studied marine biology uh, through Stanford University at the Hopkins Marine Institute in, in Carmel. I work, do a lot of work with Doug McCarthy, who uh, is down at UCSB. I'm totally convinced. There's a lot of other people out there who look at the ocean and see dollar signs, for the lack of better words. We have a desire for lithium. We have desire for, for deep sea mining. How do you balance all these? How do you make sure that we don't exploit? I, as you point out, there's the commercial issues, interests, and then there's the natural interests. And of course, that is pervasive in every aspect of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with that. Um, and it's not for me to determine that. It, it is for me to make sure that what we do is we make aware mm. what is down there to those who will then make the choices. I would not be presumptuous enough to go into Indonesia and say to Indonesians, you should do this right. or you should make that trade-off in that way. Mm. To me, I, um, I think the important thing is to be able to intelligently, smartly balance those things because I do recognize that there are fabulous resources. I think it, it makes, it's a problem when it's dealt as a black and white type of issue mm. and you say there will be no development or there'll be no mining or there'll be mm. nothing along those lines. Right. Just imagine we did that above earth and we say there will be no mining, there will right. be no development and so you on. You can't have a new you, phone. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> right? We couldn't have a yeah. lot, right? So that's not our responsibility to do that. Our responsibility is to inform, including ref informing on how the, might, the best balances might exist. Mm. We try to do that, but those are not our choices. Mm. Our goal, of course, is to show it, to excite people, and to discover it. And, and what we found is, there was a clip on there, what we found is that by showing it, legislation changes. Interesting. You know, yeah. So the clip okay. on there, we, um, on, on our ship, um, a large portion of um, Blue Planet 2 mm -hmm. was shot from our ship, right? And as a result of that, Blue Planet 2, it had a fabulous effect and it changed legislation in the UK mm. in order to produce a lot of protections and eliminating mm. uh, plastics, plastics in the ocean and so on. And that came out of the awareness and the caring. Mm. So those are the types of things that we can do. Mm. So what about the areas, well, 
What about the areas of the deep sea that don't belong to any country, that don't belong to Indonesia, that are out there beyond, you know, take the Clarion Clipperton zone outside of, you know, from the Gulf of Mexico, I believe, in between the Gulf of Mexico and Hawaii, where there's interest in mining, but there's also been, I believe, a sponge found. You know, 5,000 new species have been found there just in the last few years, and one of the sponges found there um, has been linked to the fight, you know, may hold the, the key to be a powerful weapon in the fight against um, antibiotic resistance, right? So you hold these things both at the same time. The areas that aren't, don't belong to any country, how does that happen? Well, does that happen there? Um, unfortunately, we don't get to make the rules. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I would like you to make the so, rules, uh, right? So I, I can't, uh, that becomes a governance question, but what we can do is to bring that to everybody's attention. Yeah. Right? We've worked very closely with the United Nations on issues like this, mm -hmm. okay? With their attention, with them being informed, then choices can be made regarding governance. What if, I'd love to know, in, when we spoke ahead of this session, you were telling me about the Red Sea and the governance of the Red Sea, and actually that it could be a model, I believe, for how other countries deal with it. Tell me a little bit about, about that. Well, I think it's so interesting because here we are in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, um, fortunately, the Red Sea has not been discovered. Hmm. Saudis think of, you know, the desert. Right. Okay, so His Royal Highness decided that it, they're going to develop the Red Sea as for various purposes. And he is a purist. Hmm. He, he doesn't as we look at uh, NEOM, for example, and the development of NEOM, there needs to be desalinization to get the water. But the problem with desalinization is it produces brine, and when you put mm -hmm. brine back in the water, it's not so good. Right. There is not enough tech, proper technology in order to do that purely, but he will not accept anything less than pure. Mm -hmm. So they will go on and develop new technology so that that can be done in an absolutely pure way. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you have this pristine environment that is not, discover not discovered, not abused, and so on. And that will be, a, really, I think, a gift to the world. You're going to see from NEON to uh, the Red Sea uh, Development Project and mm -hmm. other things, you're going to see more people going there, more people from all over the world. And that's a symbiotic relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, because if they bring it, bring it in, for Saudis, it's a wonderful place to go. From those in the other part of the world, it's a wonderful place to, be, mm. to go. And to be able to do it, it'll be done in a way that's unbelievable. Unbelievably pure and unbelievably exciting. Mm. I wish I could tell you all of the things that you will be in store mm. that will be blowing your mind. Right. Because when you go there, you are going to experience the ocean in a way that you can't otherwise, mm. and it's connected with these other environments. So that's what's going on there. Fascinating. Give us a sense of what's next for Ocean X. Where else are you going to be going? Well, uh, we're going to go, uh, after we finish this, we're going to go to uh, COP28. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and and through the, uh, through the Gulf, and uh, thanks to um, Abu Dhabi and their interest in exploration, and their, we'll do mm -hmm. exploration uh, in the Gulf. And then we'll go to COP28. And in COP28, mm. we'll have the ship there, and we're going to have a lot of uh, events, a lot of dinners with heads of states and other people who are interested in this area. And so we'll be uh, finding out mm. what are the other symbiotic relationships. Then we're going to leave there, and we're going to go into the Red Sea. We'll go through the, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, Seychelles. Yeah. Uh, um, the. Um, uh, Gulf of Oman to, to Seychelles. Okay, the, okay. Gulf of Oman to Seychelles. And okay. then, and then we'll the go signal. from there to the Indian Ocean, all through the Indian Ocean, and then we'll go to Indonesia. Fantastic. You looking for a journalist to come along? <laughs> <laughs> Always looking for part. Yes. Great. <laughs> you show it. Right. Um, just tell us what you'd like from the audience here. What would you like them to do, both of you, Vincent? Well, I guess one of the things that's such an advantage of being an Ocean X is traveling the world and seeing things. And we see things that work and things that don't work. And I think part of what Ray is talking about is bring to light the beauty of the place and how it's, it is possible to both 
explore and develop in a, in a manner that you, you maintain and sustain those. Or they're not, they're not at necessarily at odds with each other, I think, as much hmm. as people think it is. So my opinion is not to view that as race Either that are black or, or white. It, it's possible, and it's been done, to have both. Two things I'd like. Um, first, some of the people here, think about what the symbiotic relationships might be. Hmm. Or second, enjoy it. Enjoy what we're putting out. You're here because you're interested in the subject. Mm. In one way or another. So either just enjoy it and consume it and pass it along to other people, or find out what are the symbiotic relationships, the other partnerships that we mm. can do that we can have an impact together. I love it. So anything I haven't asked you that you might want to make sure you say? I'd say look forward to seeing the Red Sea the way we've seen it. Yeah. As Ray said, okay. in the next five years, you're going to have a chance. And I think it was precedent to help bring us here early, with, but you're going to have the similar kind of um, access to the Saudi Red Sea that we've had. And let me tell you, you're in for a treat. Hmm. So stay tuned. Amazing. So I've enjoyed exploring this incredible wilderness with both of you. you there was a little clip with Sylvia Earle, who's one of my great heroes, and she is an ocean explorer as well. She said, the ocean is a vast and wondrous place, full of mystery and wonder. It's the cradle of life on Earth, and it continues to hold many secrets. The more we explore the ocean, the more we learn about its, important, its importance to the, our planet and to ourselves. So thank you so much to the audience for listening and to Ray and Vince for your time. Our pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.